you know that we, we're talking about the topic of, of hell. And um, let me just turn to John 3. We're talking about the topic of hell and it's just funny because as I sort of like build this, these sermons together, you know, each point becomes like its own sermon. So I, I just wanted to talk today um, about babies, pretty much. Babies, you know, what happens to babies when they die? And I've just titled the sermon, Why All Babies Go to Heaven. Um, so why all babies go to heaven and just address that topic in depth and just give you an understanding of, of why all babies go to heaven. Uh, so, you know, one question is, what ultimately, what ultimately sends a person to hell? Because uh, this is where this point sort of drew out from. I want to talk about, you know, why people go to hell, what ultimately sends them to hell. So, the first question is, you know, what ultimately sends a person to hell? And, you know, your first reaction might be, well, sin sends them to hell. Um, but that's not actually the right answer. Because, see, sin makes us deserving of hell. You know, the wages of sin is death. You know, James says, you know, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So yes, hell is the punishment for sin, and sin makes you deserving of hell, but it's not actually what's, or what I believe sends you to hell. Uh, and we read here in John 3, 16, a very familiar passage. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we're familiar with this passage because we re return to it a lot when we go out soul winning. But it's clear here that the dividing line between who goes to heaven, who goes to hell, who's condemned and who is not condemned is not who has sinned and who hasn't sinned. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if sin is what sends us to hell, sin is what, why everyone deserves hell. But if sin is what sends us to hell, then everyone would go to hell. You know, because we're all sinners. But those of us who believe do not go to hell because we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So even though sin is what makes us deserving of hell, it isn't what ultimately sends us there because the grace is now available. And the way I like to think of it is, let's say all of us are in prison. We're in, let's say this is a jail, right? And we're all in jail. We're all convicted. We're all guilty. But then someone unlocks the front door and says, you know what? Everyone can go free. Now, we, we deserve to be in jail because of our crime, and that's why, well, I guess we are, I guess, in already condemned, like the Bible says. But now that the grace is offered to us, we are no longer in jail because of our crime, because we can be let out. We can be free. We're in jail because we refuse to accept the grace that is offered and leave, leave that prison, in a sense. That's, that's how I like to think of it. So... That's why even though it's, it sort of uh, goes against you know, your initial reaction, because you'd be like, wait a second, isn't sin what makes us deserving of hell? Yes, it makes us deserving of hell, but it doesn't actually condemn us and send us to hell because the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ is available to us. So what actually sends a person to hell is rejecting the grace of God, rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. And hopefully that analogy of the criminals in jail sort of gives you an understanding of why that is. Now let's turn to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 12, 13. Now I'm sorry, Michael, if this sermon is not really new, new to you because we talk about this a lot, but this is an interesting topic that maybe, if I haven't had this discussion with you guys about it, uh, is interesting about this whole topic of babies and why they go to heaven when they die. <coughs> All right, so we see here in uh, 2 Samuel 13, so then another question we have is, you know, people ask, do babies go to heaven when they die? And obviously we know the answer to that is yes, but we're trying to understand why that's the case. Uh, we just go here to 2 Samuel 12. It says here in verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So just the, so you get the context of this passage, Nathan has just come to David after he's committed adultery with Bathsheba and killed Uriah the Hittite. And Nathan has come and given him that parable about the traveler, uh, the rich man that took this other guy's uh, lamb and, and used it instead of his own from his own flock. And now has told him, you know, 
thou art the man. David is actually the person in that, that parable. And now in verse 13 he says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah, Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. And this is the key point in this passage here. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her, unto her, and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Now this is the passage that we really go to, to show that babies go to heaven, because David, in the Old Testament, had an understanding that when he lost a baby, that that baby would be in heaven, because uh, David is saying here, um, in verse, um, uh, where is it here? In verse 23, it says, I shall go to him. And we know David was saved. David, when he died, would have gone to heaven. And David here had the understanding that when his baby died, would be in heaven, because David's saying, I'm going to go to him where the baby is, but he cannot return to me. He will not um, come back to life. So that is where we get the understanding of babies going to heaven. And it's a very comforting thought because people have lost babies through miscarriages. People have lost babies through... through um, through, through um, you know, accidents or whatnot. And, and if we go by this doctrine of the Catholic Church of original sin, where in the, the guilt is inherited, how do you explain how a baby goes to heaven? Because you know, if a baby is a guilty sinner, it deserves hell, why do they get pardoned and, and, and somebody who does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't? And, and we'll go through that in a moment. But just a couple of thoughts on this passage. So we see here that David had the understanding that whilst it was tragic for the baby to die, he would see the baby again in heaven. Now another point I just wanted to bring up in this passage, you can see here that losing the baby was an undesired consequence of his action. I don't actually think it was a punishment for his sin, and I'll go into that a bit later, but you can see that, that God actually put away his sin. So it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't make sense for God to then punish David for his sin if... God had put away his sin, in, in my eyes. So to me, I, I think it's more so because God didn't want an illegitimate child to, to be one of David's children, you know, because he was born of adultery, um, as opposed to um, just born of, a, of another wife, you know, of another unmarried wife or one of his concubines. I think that's, that's what it's more about. We see there in um, uh, verse... <coughs> 14, you know, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So I think it was another reason God took the life of that child. But the point I wanted to make here is just, you see how it was an undesired consequence of his action, meaning, you know, David did not want to lose the child, but for whatever reason God had, God took the child from him. And the point I just want to make there is, you know, it's sad that today that people willingly do not want children. You know, whereas David, it was sad for a child to be taken from him, and yet we live in a day and age where people willingly do not want children, and it just shows how our values have changed. You know, our values have changed from wanting lots of children to 
to, to being sad to the point he's fasting and not even wanting to eat to save the life of this child. And yet people nowadays don't want children at all. So I just think, um, you know, it's, it's um, sad how far we strayed from, from the values of God's word. Okay, so let's just get into the, the meat of the sermon today, which is basically, you know, how is it possible for a baby to go to heaven if we are born as um, sinners? Now, the, right, the wrong answer, I think, is God just pardons babies because they're babies, even though they're guilty of sin. Because, see, that doesn't make sense to me that, you know, it's sort of like the, the, the Muslim idea of Allah. Right? You know how Muslims will tell you, well, we don't need a saviour because Allah can do whatever he wants. Right? And if Allah can do whatever he wants, it doesn't matter if you're a sinner and you're guilty of sin and you deserve hell. Allah is all merciful and Allah can just forgive you because he can do whatever he wants. Right? And we know that that is a, a false view of God because obviously if God declares a decree, right? And he declares a law and says, you know, it, it's, yes, God can do whatever he wants. But, it, but he can't lie, you know, so he can't do things that are against his nature. He can't do things that are like, you know, uh, irrational. You know, we talked about, you know, God can't create a, a square with three sides. So we can't have like an illogical thing for God to do. Uh, not, not, not something that is impossible for man to do, but it's a miracle. Um, but something that is just illogical. And, and God won't do things according to his nature. So he's not going to, to sin. So if God sets a law and says, you know, well, the, the punishment of sin is death, and then God just goes against what he said he would do, then, then that is something God cannot, cannot do. That doesn't make sense. Um, so we don't worship a God that just decrees laws and then sins against his own laws. It says he will do something, and then he doesn't do it. So this idea that Allah is just all forgiving, and uh, that just means Allah has no integrity towards his own decree of justice. He has determined a punishment for sin and then has no integrity, doesn't keep that punishment. And this is why we have to have a different reason for why babies go to heaven and, and not that they are born sinners, they are born guilty and, and we're born deserving of hell, but yet for whatever reason, you know, for, for, for no reason at all, God can just pardon them of their sin and they can be covered under the blood without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because then you ask the question, whether well, a baby can be covered by the blood without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, with that perspective, meaning they are guilty and deserving of hell, but they can be pardoned under the blood without faith, why then does an adult, why can't an adult be pardoned but from his sin without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you see what I mean? So I think that's the wrong uh, answer, that God cannot just pardon sin without justice. So how to then do we understand this situation? So number one, God can't just pardon sin without justice. My second point is, you know, it is true that babies do sin from birth. So they, they, they are born sinners and they do sin. Uh, let's have a look, look at a couple of verses there. Psalm 58, verse 3. says here, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. So I don't think this verse is just talking about you know, reprobates. I think you know, sinners are, are wicked people and we all have that wicked side of us. And it's saying here because we're born with the nature of Adam's sin, you know, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking, um, speaking lies. So I do believe that it's true that babies do sin. So I don't believe that the right position either is that babies are sinless. Because those of us that have children, we know that they're not sinless. You know, it doesn't take long for even a newborn to be lying to you, to be, you know, they're born selfish. They only think about themselves. You know, they, they, they know how to be rebellious. I mean, even the children that are my age, they know how to lie and deceive and, you know, like, they, you know, you catch them in something and they'll now lie to you to cover, cover themselves so they don't get in trouble. So it is true that babies sin. No, nobody's saying, so it's, it'd be wrong to say that babies are sinless. And, you know, the world tries to teach this philosophy that man is inherently good in need of direction. But we know from the Bible that that's not the case, that man is inherently sinful and in need of correction. And the reason why I just make this point quickly is you have to be really careful out there with parenting philosophies. You know, 
when, when you have children and you know, you, you're Googling and you're trying to figure out what's the best way to do things, just make sure you always check it back with the Word of God. Because generally there are those two uh, philosophies out there when you look at any parenting method. There are the parenting methods that believe that children are inherently good and you're trying to just to bring that good out of them and direct them into a certain way. And then there's obviously our philosophy on parenting that children are sinful and they need to be disciplined, they need to be corrected, they need to be changed because if you just allow them to be who they are, they're going to be a sinner. They're going to be foolish and the rod of correction needs to drive that foolishness from them. So no, children are not inherently good. People are not inherently good and just need to be directed a certain way. Uh, people are inherently bad and need correction. So just be aware of those when you're researching different parenting methods and parenting philosophies. <clears throat> One of them, I'll just give you an example because um, it, we sort of do it in a way. Um, where, uh, you know, when you're trying to wean your child off, of, from, from milk and wean them onto food. And, you know, th there's this philosophy out there that is um, called baby led weaning, which is basically you allow the child to just experiment and just eat what they want. And, you know, if they don't want to eat something, you don't give it to them. If they want to eat something, you give it to them. So, whilst I do, I do agree, and we do in our plate, in, in our house, we do just let the children determine when they want to start eating solids. The difference is we don't let the child decide what solids they're going to eat. So you see how we, we take a philosophy that's out there, this baby-led weaning, and whilst I do understand that it's natural for a child once, they start, once they're ready for food to start reaching for food, but I know that a child is only going to eat what they want to eat and not what they need to eat. So as a parent, knowing that a child is just going to do what they want, I need to force them to eat what they don't want to eat so that they're not a picky eater. And if I force them to eat what they don't want to eat, they will eventually like it. And, it, and we've seen that in our own family. Because, you know, we eat, uh, you guys know we eat sauerkraut, which is like a fermented cabbage. It's really sour. I mean, most kids, when they first eat it, it's like eating a lemon, right? They're like, oh, like, what is it? But we just keep, keep giving it to them. If they don't like it, it's like, no, you have to eat it. And we force them to eat it. And now they love it. Now they, they eat like cups and cupsfuls of it. So, you know, don't, uh, you know, you just be aware of your children, you know, eat and don't eat things. If you force them to eat it at a young age, they will grow up liking it because they'll get that acquired taste. And we've even found in our own family, they didn't like it. And then there was a period where like, they, they really would go against eating it and you'd still just have to force it a little bit. And then all of a sudden they're, they're fine eating it. And it just doesn't even, work. so I don't know where that switch takes place in their head. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's like that. And that's why our kids are, are generally not very fussy with what they eat. They just eat whatever because we force them to eat it. And if they don't eat it, they get spanked. And there's that sort of process of correction. And then one day, um, the fruit of your labor all of a sudden uh, comes out and you're not sure when that, when that switch took place. All right, so God can't just pardon sin without justice. Um, babies are not born sinless. So number two, it's true that babies do sin. They go from the womb speaking lies. Um, all right, so number three, um, Adam's sin. So this idea of original sin, Adam's sin only gave us the tendency to sin. So we, we, inherent, we inherited the sin nature from Adam. That, that is a truth. So <clears throat> let's go to uh, Psalm 51. And there's five. We'll just go through a couple of verses real quick here. He says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So I don't believe he's saying there that my mother sinned and I was the result of, of like adultery or fornication. He's just saying that, you know, because we have that sinful nature, this is what I believe, because we have that sinful nature of Adam, even from the point we were conceived, we, were, we had that sinful nature. Um, Ephesians 2 verse 3, it says here, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. So all of us, right, we all inherit this nature, among who also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, and, and, and so on. 
um, goes on to talk about the grace. So we see there the nature, by nature, we were the children of wrath. So we inherited this sinful nature from Adam. Hebrews. Uh, we see here talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, so talking about you know, man being flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. So he's saying that Jesus took on this flesh, took on this nature uh, um, that we have. Well, oh, sorry, took on, took on the, the flesh that we have, right? Uh, not, not the nature of Adam, uh, uh, Christ didn't. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For, for verily he took not him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be, made, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make re reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is also he is able to succor them that are tempted. So the reason I just wanted to go to this verse is, is, you know, it shows here that, see, this doctrine of original sin, it's right and wrong depending on how you interpret what that doctrine is. Because, see, original sin is right in the sense that we inherit the sin nature, meaning we are all born of that flesh and we have a tendency to sin. So we have that tendency to sin because we are born of flesh. And Jesus Christ took on flesh. So he was tempted with sin, right? He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Now, if original sin means we inherit the guilt of sin, that, that can't be right because then Christ cannot take on that nature because that means he would have had sin. But he can't have sin, but he's born with that nature. So he was tempted to sin, but he did not sin. So if you take original sin in the sense that we inherit the nature, the tendency to sin, yes, I agree with it. If you take original sin as we are guilty of sin, and like the Catholics believe, that's why you need to be baptized as a baby to wash away that sin. Obviously, baptism does not wash away sin. Um, they have the wrong understanding of original sin. So we don't inherit the guilt, we just inherit the nature. Uh, let's look at a couple of other verses real quick. Romans 7, 17. 17 it says, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So this is Paul talking about the struggle between the uh, the spirit and the flesh for i know that is in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good i find not so we see there the 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 evil flesh the sin that dwells in him in dwells in him is the flesh and the last one we'll go to is galatians 5 19 where we see here the works of the flesh now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Now that one's always an interesting one that I point out just because, you know, we don't, have, we don't want to have this mindset that if somebody believes the wrong thing, that automatic, automatically makes them not saved. We just want to be careful there because it's possible for a saved person to believe the wrong thing, even if that thing is a heresy. Do you know what I mean? So just because, you know, and, and I sort of got caught up in this and was corrected on this because, for example, just because somebody, you know, believes in repent of your sins, it doesn't necessarily mean they're not saved. Now, is that doctrine heresy? Yes. Is that doctrine going to get anybody saved? No. But does it mean that person that is necessary right now caught up in that doctrine not saved? No, because a person that believes a heresy can fit into two categories. They can be somebody that's not saved, that's preaching heresy, or they can be somebody that's saved, that's preaching heresy. Do you know what I mean? It's the same with like losing your salvation or certain things like that. They can be heretical. You know, like for example, we believe Jesus Christ went to hell and I believe if that's not a part of it, you know, it can also almost be blasphemous and it's, and it's it is a part of salvation. But can a saved person not believe that? Yes, because it's possible for the flesh to have heresies. So I just think that's interesting. So don't, you know, I, because we can't see a person's heart, you know, I personally have come to the position where I don't make absolute statements about somebody's salvation because at the end of the day, I don't know. I can stand in doubt, like Paul says about the Galatians, you know, I stand in doubt of you. But should I say, you are not saved because you're believing this? Well, I don't know 100% sure. 
I can say if somebody believes this, they won't get saved if they're not saved. Um, just because here, I think the Bible says here, it's pretty clear that the works of the flesh are heresies and we still have the flesh. So it is possible for a saved person to have wrong doctrines. <clears throat> so just be careful with that accusation on who is saved and who isn't, just because we don't know who is, but we can definitely doubt. So maybe it's just, you know, I'm not, I think you're not saved, <laughs> as opposed to I know you're not saved. Um, okay, so God can't pardon sin without justice. It's true that babies sin from birth. Adam's sin gave us a sinful nature. So the original sin un correctly understood is that we're given this tendency to sin, not that we are guilty of his sin. And why don't we inherit? This is my point number four. Why do we not inherit uh, Adam's guilt? Well, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. Because there is a principle here in Deuteronomy it says here, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So the Bible's telling us here, you know, sometimes God, you know, will reveal and, and judge a nation and you know, we'll just wipe out everybody. But it's saying here, this is part of the law. So this is part of a, of a judicial judgment saying that if a, if a father sins, if a father commits murder, you don't put his child to death because of that. He needs to pay for his own sin. And I think we can take this principle from this law here. That's why it would not be fair for, for a person to be sent to hell because of Adam's sin. You know, if Adam sin, Adam needs to be saved for that sin, or if he does not get saved, he will go to hell for his sin. But it's not fair, for example, for Timothy to go to hell because I reject the grace of God. You know, so there's that principle there. But if we inherited Adam's guilt, then you would have that, that situation where a baby is a sinner and he's guilty of hell. How can God just go against his decree and just pardon that person without that baby coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the right scenario? How does this baby then not accountable for his sin, but yet the baby is a sinner? So he doesn't inherit Adam's guilt because if he did, we would have that problem there of, of a person uh, going to hell for, for somebody else's sins. Go to Ezekiel, we'll look at Ezekiel 18.20. Again, we see here, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So this principle here, that you are accountable for your own sin. And I just made a comment here, but you know, what, what about David's baby? You know, and that's why I sort of mentioned that there. Well, you know, didn't David's baby get killed because of David's sin? I'm not so sure if that's the case, and I do know, know, I do know that there is a physical accountability. I think it's a bit different. You know, I haven't, I haven't figured it all out. But when it comes to David, I was just thinking, well, remember David's sin was put away from God. So I don't think the child was killed because of David's adultery and because of David's murder. I believe the child was killed for other reasons. You know, the Bible says, you know, you've given great occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. And that's why the child was killed. The child wasn't killed because of David's sin. So that, that might sort of put that in perspective. So we don't inherit Adam's guilt. Um, people are only put to death for their own sin. And I believe that's why that person is only sent to hell because of his own sin. He's not sent to hell because of um, Adam's sin. Okay, let's go on to point five. So God can pardon sin without justice. It's true that babies sin from birth. Uh, Adam's sin gave us a sinful nature, so the tendency to sin. So original sin is not that we inherit Adam's guilt. We only inherit um, Adam's uh, flesh, his tendency to sin, because we're all born of, of flesh and blood. All right, so, so then the question is, so you know, what, what am I getting to? So why can a baby go to heaven even though they're still a sinner? Well, let me explain. Uh, in, let's go to Deuteronomy. And we'll see this principle here. And, and Kevin alluded to it in his sermon. 
But remember we read about in, 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 in the Old Testament, you know, where the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt and remember they spied the land, the, the, the 12, I believe it was the 10 spies went in um, and eight of them came back saying, oh, you know, these people are too big for us. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. But remember Caleb and Joshua said, no, no, we can, we can go in. The Lord is with us. We can take this land. If, why, would the God, why would God promise it to us and not deliver them into our hand? But because the people, the, the eight spies came back and, and struck fear into the people, remember the people complained and they believed the eight spies over, the, over Caleb and Joshua. And because of that, God did not let them go into the promised land. And we, and we learn in Hebrews that they did not go in because of unbelief. So just that's the context of the passage. And I just wanted to bring you here because there's, there's an interesting uh, point here made in Deuteronomy where the people now have wandered through the wilderness for 40 years and that generation did die and now they're going in and, and, and Moses is giving the law the second time to the people that have gone through the wilderness and have survived that culling in a sense and now are about to enter into the promised land and cross over the river Jordan. Moses says here in verse 34, And the Lord heard the voice of your words. So that this is talking about the, the Israel and the people before that murmured and was wroth, was angry, and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he had trodden upon, and to his children, because he wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. So he was angry. Remember, Moses struck the rock, so he wasn't allowed to go in either. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Now look here in verse 39. Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Now, when I read this verse, this gave me a bit of insight why a baby goes to heaven, why a baby can go to heaven, and why an adult that is a sinner and doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ cannot. Um, it gives us a bit of insight because it says here in verse 39, Moreover, your little ones, which he said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil. So the reason why a baby can go to heaven when they die is because they have no knowledge. And we're given, and let's go to Romans 7, because I believe Romans 7 actually explains to us the, the logic behind why this is the case. Why not having this knowledge um, allows a baby to be not accountable for their sins. So let's read here uh, in Romans 7. We'll just read from verse 7. So it says here, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Why is he saying that? Because it says here for earlier on, I'll just show you here, it says that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So it's talking about this law having dominion over him. But he's saying, is, is there something wrong with the law having dominion over you? Is it something wrong? Is the law sinful? So he continues on in verse 7 and he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, God forbid. He's like, no, there's nothing wrong with the law. Nothing wrong with the law of God. Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, so no, I had not known sin, but by the law. So he's saying here, the law is not sin, but the reason why I know I'm a sinner is because of God's law. Because God's law says, don't do it, that's how I know what sin is. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So, so we don't know lust is a sin, that lust is wrong, unless God says it's wrong. And that's the only reason why anything is, is wrong, because God said it. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. And I think that's the key there. So he's saying here, when he, when he didn't have the commandment of God, well, he's saying, well, sin, he says the reason why sin wrought in him this concupiscence is because of the commandment. Because without the commandment, the sin was dead. And I think that's the key there. And I'll just come back to that in a second. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. 
For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So there's that, you know, the, the law is not sinful. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's, it's holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? So he's saying, is, is it the law that was good? Is that what killed me? God forbid. No, it's not the law that kills me, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So what is Paul explain, explaining here? It's saying here that the reason why sin kills him is because of the law. And he didn't know that it was sin until he knew the law. So how do we tie that in with Deuteronomy 1 and why babies go to, go to heaven when they die? Well, it's because they are born sinners. They sin. They, yes, they have that sin nature, but because they have no knowledge of good and evil, we read in Deuteronomy 1, they have no knowledge of the law. The sin that they have is dead. And this is what Paul is explaining to us in Romans 7, that even though we have that sin in us from birth, it's dead. And it's not until the point where we understand the law that we know the difference between good and evil, that that sin then revives and then our soul dies. So one of the wrong things about original sin is it teaches that we are born spiritually dead. No, no, we are born spiritually alive. Because how can God kill us spiritually if we're not guilty of sin? And if, if we're born spiritually dead, that means we deserve hell. Then how can a baby be pardoned from hell without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? And the way is, because even though they are a sinner, the sin that they have is dead because they have no knowledge between good and evil. They have no knowledge of the law. Then when they get that knowledge, and you know who knows what that age is, but once they get that knowledge and they understand now that they are breaking the law and they need a savior, the sin in them is now taking occasion by the commandment. It revives, then their soul dies, and now they are accountable for their sin and they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes people resist this doctrine because they say, how can a person, if they're a sinner, be born spiritually alive? And I think I've just explained to you why, because they're not held accountable for their sin because their sin is dead in them. It's not made alive. And, and we see here in verse 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And I think that verse proves that Paul is saying here, I was spiritually alive when I was born. I was spiritually alive before the law. Then when the law came, I spiritually died. Some people say that this verse is saying, well, Paul was just alive physically. And, you know, he was alive physically, and then he learned about the law, and then... He's talking about dying spiritually. Well, to me, that doesn't make sense because number one, it's in the same verse. So how do you jump all of a sudden from being you know, physically alive and then when he says sin revived and I died, it's talking about a physical death. That doesn't make sense. And second of all, Paul didn't die when the commandment came. When he says the commandment came, sin revived and I died, he didn't die physically. So what does he mean? It's because he died spiritually. His soul died. And that's why I believe in verse 9 when he says, I was alive without the law. He's saying he was spiritually alive at one point. So we're not born spiritually dead. We're born spiritually alive. Then when we get the knowledge of the law, the sin revives and then it kills us. I just wanted to make a quick point here about the sin being dead. And I just wanted to tie this into a totally unrelated topic. But I just, I just wanted to mention this to you. That when something is dead, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And the reason why I'm saying this is because how often will people say to you, faith without works is dead and you're not saved because you don't have faith. No, you have faith and if you have faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved, but your faith is dead. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. If it doesn't have works, the faith is dead. It doesn't mean you're not saved. And I just wanted to point this out because it says here that the, that the, that the sin is dead. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. What does it mean? If we go a bit further up in the chapter... We read here in verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So verse 4 is saying we are saved in order to bring forth fruit unto God. And I just want you to see what it's contrasted here in the next couple of verses. In verse 5, For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. 
But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So what are the two comparisons here? There's the walking in the spirit. We're saved to walk in the spirit and bring forth fruit unto God, which is like life. Or we walk in our flesh and we bring forth fruit unto death. So the reason why I think the Bible describes sin as being dead is because it's not bringing forth fruit. See, because if your faith is alive, you bring forth fruit unto God. When, sin is al when the sin is alive, it brings forth fruit unto death and kills you. right? But when the sin is dead, it's not bringing forth that fruit. So without the knowledge of the law, the knowledge of the commandments, the sin is dead. That's why it's not killing the baby spiritually yet. It's not killing that person because it hasn't brought forth that fruit unto death. Does that make sense? So when something is dead, it doesn't bring forth fruit. It's not profitable. And that's how we understand James 2. Because James 2 is about your faith being profitable to another man. And that's why it says, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Yes, faith can save him, but is it profitable to another person? No. So it's here, it doesn't bring forth this fruit unto God. Your faith doesn't have this life that Romans is talking about. Um, it, it doesn't bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and I just wanted to show you this other verse um, in Romans 4 that shows that dead does not necessarily mean non-existent. Um, it, it's this idea of bringing forth fruit. <clears throat> uh, the Bible says here, where are they? Oh, yeah. I'll just read from verse 17, talking about Abraham here. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. This is talking about Abraham. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And verse 19 is the one I just want us to focus on. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. See, so he calls Abraham's body dead. Did his body not exist? No, it existed. It just was dead. When he was about 100 years old, and look at this, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So this idea of dead is that in this, in this sense, because obviously dead can mean a lot of things, but in this sense it can also mean that it doesn't bring forth fruit. Um, and that's how I think we can understand James. You know, it's not bringing forth fruit and being profitable to somebody else. And how we also understand sin. Because when sin is dead, it doesn't bring forth fruit unto death and doesn't kill you spiritually. And that is why a baby goes to heaven when they die. So it's not because God just pardons them for no reason. It's not because they're born sinless. They are born a sinner, but because without the knowledge of the law, the sin is dead. It hasn't killed them spiritually when they do understand the Lord, then they die spiritually, and now they have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the age in this sermon. Um, we'll discuss that in the next sermon. Okay, so the last passage I want to go to is Galatians. Galatians 3. 16. Because I think we actually see this same principle... Um, we see this same principle in um, Galatians 3 of the purpose of the law and the law coming to, to reveal sin and to, and to condemn us, not to undo the covenant. Um, and I just thought it was interesting because it was kind of related to Romans 7. It says here in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So I'll just mention there, you know, my position on the Jews is I don't believe the Jews are God's chosen people. Um, the question is really, who are the real Jews? And I think Galatians 3 is very clear that the promise of Abraham and to his seed was to Jesus Christ, not to seeds. So it says there, um, he saith, and not to seeds as of many. So the promise of Abraham was not to his physical descendants, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So what is it saying here? It's saying here that the, the, the law, the Old Testament covenant, came 430 years after Abraham. Because remember, the law came by Moses 
Abraham was 430 years before. So 430 years before, God is promising Abraham, you know, in your seed shall, you know, uh, you'll, you'll be blessed. Um, the promise to the seed. So he's saying here, well, the, the covenant that came 430 years later of the law doesn't make the promise to Abraham of none effect, right? Verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he's saying what he promised to Abraham um, was by promise and not of the law. So the law is not going to make the um, promise of none effect. And the verse I just wanted to point out here is verse 19 in this passage. Because listen to this. Wherefore then serveth the law? So the question is saying, well, why then did God give the law? If Abraham already knew he was going to be saved by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there have been a law which could have been given, which if there have been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith is come, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So I think that is um, uh, very clear that it's those of us that believe on Jesus Christ are the ones that inherit the promises of Abraham and not his physical descendants. Um, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things here that were just similar to Romans 7. Remember how it says in Romans 7, I had not known um, sin. Well, I can't remember the exact same, but he, he said, I didn't know sin, but by the law. And it's just interesting here that in verse 19 that it says, why was the Lord given? It was given because of transgression. So that same principle of the reason why God gave the law, it wasn't given to them, what a lot of people think, to keep the law in order to be saved. No, people in the Old Testament were not, not saved by the law. You know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Salvation by grace is all through the Bible. So the, the Old Testament law was not given in order for them to keep and to be saved. Because, you know, uh, Paul is saying here in Galatians that if there was a law given where righteousness could be obtained, then we wouldn't have righteousness by faith. We would have righteousness by the law. But the law was not given in order to keep and for us to be saved. The law was given to show how sinful we were. Because the promise was always there by faith. The law was added 430 years later because of transgression to show you that you're a sinner. And that's why uh, the law is given. I just think that's interesting. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say here is, you see here in verse 24, where there's that principle again, where it says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Again, see the law teaching us that we're sinners, teaching us that we're sinners, that we need a savior, that we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the law. So when the Bible says here, but after that faith is come, sorry, did I just skip that out? Verse 25, it says, But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Uh, what does it say? Oh, am I missing? It says we are no longer under the law. Or did I miss that verse? Let's bring us to Christ. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking of another verse. I was just thinking that, you know, when, when people say we're no, long, no longer under law, we're under grace. Uh, verse 24, yeah, thanks. So it goes, But after that faith is come, oh, it says we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So I guess the thought I was having, maybe I was thinking of the other verse when I wrote verse 25 in my notes where it says we're no longer under law, we're under grace. It doesn't mean that therefore the law no longer applies in the sense of, yes, it's still our moral compass. It still tells us what is morally right and morally wrong. It, when it says we're no longer under the law, it means we are not under the law in, in terms of how we are justified. You know, we were never justified by the law. We're not under the law. 
in order to be saved, we are under grace, meaning we have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And just one last point, one last point. I thought that was the last verse I was going to go to, but I just want to show you this. Romans 2, verse 14. So I hope that gives you a good understanding of why babies go to heaven. It sort of went in depth, but you know, basically the conclusion is because they don't understand the law, their sin is dead, they haven't died spiritually. So the last question I just want to finish on is people then would ask the question, well then when we preach the gospel to somebody, when we preach the law of God to somebody, are we condemning them by now they, they're not ignorant? You know, people, I've seen this meme on Facebook where it's like a picture of an Eskimo or something like that. And it'll say like, if I would have gone to heaven in ignorance and, and gone to heaven anyway because I didn't know the law, did you just condemn me by telling me about it? Uh, no, because, you know, the reason why I don't think that's the case for adults is because the Bible says here in Romans 2, 14 and 15, it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things which are contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So it's not that when you preach the gospel to somebody, now you're condemning them, and if you didn't preach to them, they would have gone to heaven anyway. No, because the law of God is written on their heart, their conscience bears witness, so that's how they come to the knowledge of the law, because it's already built into them. Then when they know, they know they're a sinner, they know they need a saviour, that they cannot justify themselves. So it only applies to babies, because they do not have this knowledge, they do not have the knowledge and the conscience, I don't know if it's not bearing witness, or they don't understand it yet. But I also think that this principle can be applied to disabled people. You know, because people often are mentally disabled or they, they're born where they always have the mentality of a child. And um, so I, I think it can apply to mentally disabled people as well. And that's why I think if somebody does not have the capacity to understand the law, does not have the capacity to understand the gospel, I believe when they die, they will go to heaven. Um, and the reason why I'm just preaching this today is so you have the right understanding of why they go to heaven. Because if you understand it a different way, I think it's actually false doctrine, meaning people are either sinless or they're born guilty of sin and somehow God pardons them without any justice. So I hope that was interesting for you and you learned something there. And we'll continue on that topic because I really wanted to preach about why people go to hell. Um, but I just wanted to cover the topic of babies. Um, so it became its own point. Anyways, let's sing a song and then we'll start setting up... Um, for lunch. Let's, uh, let's pray first.